Hi! So, you guys have lots of questions, it seems. Um, I asked on Twitter and over on Instagram if any of you guys had any plant Q&A questions for me that I could answer in a little video. Yeah, tons of you got back to me with questions, so lots of them were repeats and there were lots of common themes and some of them are going to be the topic of some specific kind of tutorial videos I've got coming up but I thought I would take the time to answer the ones that I can right now. What I would say is I am no like definitive expert on plants, I don't have any like formal qualifications or anything like that, I just love plants, I've been collecting them for several years now and I've kind of learned loads of tips and tricks I guess along the way I've learned what certain plants seem to like and what they don't like. Take everything I say with a pinch of salt I guess because it is literally just things that I have learnt rather than, through doing basically, rather than through any kind of formal horticultural qualification or anything like that. So if I share something and you're watching this and you're like, that's totally wrong, like that doesn't work for me, then definitely, definitely like call me out slash correct me in the comments. So without further ado, Chloe asked, do I use any feeds on my guys or do I add anything to the soil? So yes is the short answer. All of the soils that I use, or most of the soils that I use, come with some form of plant fertiliser, like a slow release one inside them. I use John Innes number two for most of my house plants because the, that's a kind of really good general all-rounder compost. I often mix it in with other things. But yeah, so John Innes comes with a certain amount of fertiliser in it and that is designed to give the plant food for the first few months of its time in that soil. After that, you definitely, definitely want to feed it. As well as that, the Lechuza soil, the Lechuza pond substrate that I use, there's two types, I use both. One of them comes with tiny little pellets in it, that slow release fertilizer. They're incredible, I love that. Um, I think that lasts for several months and it's a really good foundation for the roots of the plant. And then on top of that, I fertilize my plants with either organic seaweed extract, I get them both from Amazon, I can link below, and organic rose extract. Both of them are UK produced and really, really good basically. They're totally natural and they're not chemical GM nasties. A lot of the things like baby bio or chili slash cactus focus and things like that, you definitely can use those and I have used them in the past. They've got really good instructions on the back as to how much to dilute with water and how often to feed and things like that. But personally, on my vegetables outside and my plants inside, I prefer to use natural organic fertilizers. So yeah, those, both the seaweed extract and the rose one are all rounder multi-purpose ones and they're fantastic and I've had really good results with them. So during growing periods of my plants, I probably fertilize them once every six weeks, something like that. But it, like, there's no exact science with it. I don't have like a timetable I write down and I'm like, ooh, today is watering day and today is the day I need to fertilize my plants. Like I just kind of play it by ear and I just think, do you know what, I don't think I've given them any plant food for a while. I'm gonna do that now. And often once you have fed them, you'll notice within the few weeks after that, probably they'll throw out a whole load of new leaf growth. But don't go too crazy feeding them because if you overfeed them, they can like kind of go crazy really and like be overstimulated and that's not good either. So it's finding a balance, but like I said, like just play it by ear, have a little look at your plants and go by rule of thumb really as to watering them maybe like once every six weeks once every eight weeks, four weeks, something like that um, over the growing period. And whilst they're dormant, if you have things like succulents or more tropical plants that won't grow when the temperatures drop in the UK, then don't feed them at all and water them very, very infrequently um, because you don't want the roots to rot. Next question I have uh, is, what's the best support for a cheese plant that's growing really rapidly? So cheese plants, if they're happy, grow at a rate of knots, especially if there are multiple plants within one pot, which is often the case when you purchase them. And so I'm going to do a video on propagating and repotting monstera, or cheese plants, in a couple of weeks time. So I'm gonna save all the advice of that for then and show you, because I've bought a new one just for that purpose. But what I would say is that if your cheese plant is going wild, i.e. throwing out loads of leaves or shooting out lots of air real windy roots, there are two things you can do. You can either do what the lazy man does, 
or the lazy woman in my case, and I use bamboo canes. I basically just stick a cane in the soil next to it, I prop the um, monstera plant up against the cane, and then I use either string or um, plastic covered like soft wire ties just to kind of hold the plant in place, and that gives it a bit of structure and something to hold on to. Or, if you want to go all out, you can either make or buy moss poles. They give a really nice moist and kind of squidgy, I guess, support for the plant that it can actually anchor its roots to and grow up. They really, really like that. If you have a really big monstera, it's probably a good idea next time you repot to get a moss pole. They're really, really good. They're easy to make. There's tutorials online and they're not very expensive either. Yeah, they just look kind of ugly, but I mean, lots of mine have huge canes sticking out the sides and they look ugly too, so whatever floats your boat really, but otherwise they'll just grow downwards. And I've got some on my shelves in the lounge that don't have any support at all and they kind of just drape down the side of the pot and grow and, you know, there's no real issue with that either. So just do whatever suits you best really. Laura asks, and quite a few other people actually asked, how do I keep my cats off the plants? And then are there any cat safe plants that I would recommend? So I would say that I'm really lucky with my cats, I think I've said it before, but they pretty much leave things well alone. Momo occasionally attempts to gnaw on a leaf, um, but what I find is that with Luna certainly, when she was a kitten, she was really interested in my plants, in batting at the leaves or biting them and things like that, which obviously isn't great. And so when she was a kitten, any time she would like interfere with the plants, I just like clap really loudly like that um, and it's enough for them to be like oh I don't like that stop that and it's just a kind of it, it worked for us basically in deterring all sorts of unwanted behavior from her but but especially eating the plants and I find that if Momo ever goes near it if I make that sound or if I go then they know to stay away and they quickly learn so yeah I am pretty lucky they don't do much like knocking things off the side intentionally or eating entire plants I think most cats don't eat entire plants because instinctively they know that that's not, you know, not what they want and it's not good for them. But I would say steer well clear of most ivies. This, this one actually is poisonous if the cats were to eat the entire thing. Any lilies, lilies are fatal to cats. So stay away from any lilies, cut flowers or actual plants of any of that family. Um, and just do a bit of Googling. Um, if there's a plant that you like, Google it. And if it says highly toxic to cats, probably don't have it in the house. If it says um, toxic if eaten, and then it lists the symptoms as like runny bum, you know, mild vomiting, stuff like that. I think m my thoughts are generally, you know, if they, if like, if you eat something that's gonna give you a bit of an upset tummy, then that's bad, but it's not death. And so I don't feel like, I trust my cats not to sit unattended and chomp through an entire plant. So in that respect, I do have some plants that if they were to eat the entire thing, it would make them poorly. I guess you just have to make decisions for yourself based on what you trust your cats to do slash not do. But ones that aren't poisonous, if they have a nibble, are things like succulents. Succulents and cacti are pretty much filled with water. So in, as a general rule of thumb, those aren't harmful to them. Spider plants, I don't think those are toxic. I don't believe pilia are toxic to cats either. But yeah, all I would say is, if you do want plants and you know your cat's gonna eat them and you really, really still want them, maybe put them up high somewhere that they can't get to or in a room that they don't go into when you're not there or, you know, unsupervised. Or if you're really, really worried, like, and your cat is some sort of crazy herbivore, maybe you just don't have loads of plants. At the end of the day, you don't want your cat to die because they've eaten a plant, but equally, I do think that in general, most animals will not sit and eat an entire plant just for lols because they'd much rather have something meaty or actual animal food. Karen has asked about watering of succulents and that's one of the biggest questions I get all of the time. Succulents obviously are really popular as are cacti, they are mostly desert plants so the one thing that people tend to do most of is kill them with kindness. People over water succulents like you would not believe. You know they look like they're fine one minute and then the next minute they've got squishy black stems and all the leaves are falling off and essentially you've rotted them from the roots up and the leaves are the last bit to die. So succulents are dormant in the colder months in the UK. So generally from late September, early October, all the way through to late March, they don't grow. They just sit there happily waiting for it to warm up. So during that time, 
I would just say don't water them at all unless they look particularly wrinkly and dry in which case give them a little bit of water but probably like once every couple of months over that time and and the trouble is with advising people with watering is there are so many different factors that affect like how often you should water your plant you know the humidity in the room that you've got it in the temperature in the room that you've got it in you know how close to a window it is whether that window gets direct sunlight on the leaves or whether that is an indirect sunlight which way the window's facing north south east west or anything in between you know the country you're in there are so many different factors that affect you know how much you should water any of your plants especially succulents so there is no i can't i can't give you a magic answer but plants that get a lot of sunlight um obviously need watering more than those that don't succulents like really 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 bright light so you know you want to put them on a windowsill that gets direct sunlight rather than in the middle of a room you know where it's a nice bright room but the sun isn't directly shining on it because if you do that they're just going to get really leggy long stems and leaves every so often rather than staying like a nice compact shape and then yeah if you've got multiple succulents like karen does in one pot you just need to make sure that those succulents are ones that like the same conditions because just because it's a succulent doesn't mean it's necessarily gonna like the same amount of watering as its neighbour. Echeveria, keep them all together. Crassula, put them all together. Um, often you can mix and match a little bit, but yeah, you just need to play it by ear and not overwater. Drainage holes are really important with succulents if you're not confident in getting the watering amount right, because if you don't have drainage holes and you are overwatering, you're gonna be letting the roots sit in a lot of water. Um, so my rule of thumb would be look at your succulents you know closely if you stick your finger down through the first few centimeters of soil and it's it looks dry at the top and it still feels dry give it a good water leave it again for another couple of weeks um succulents are better at telling you when they need water than when they're overwatered. so if the leaves go a little bit little bit wrinkly and a little bit less plump that's a good sign that they need a little bit of water. Give them a drink, they should plump up again. Don't water it again until the soil is dry like that again. They don't like being in damp conditions. Hopefully that'll help. Annie and loads of other people have asked me about white, fluffy, cotton wool sort of looking bug things on their succulents and houseplants. Those are mealybugs. Mealy bugs are like Satan spawn, so oh, once you get a mealy bug infestation, it's really, really important that you act really fast um, and you keep an eye on everything. So what I would say is quarantine those plants. If you don't know what mealy bugs look like on plants, Google it. There are plenty of images. Mealy bugs kill plants. They spread really quickly, and before you know it, they're out of control and they're over everything you've got. I have multiple times had to throw away a lot of beautiful succulents because the mealybugs have just got too much. So first thing preventing mealybugs, if you don't already have them, is to when you buy a new plant from a garden centre, before you bring it home, do a really good check of it. Like check the stems, check around the leaves, check in any little crevices, you know, check if it has mealybugs first. If it does, do not buy it. If it doesn't, great, bring it home, keep it in quarantine for a couple of weeks, monitor it again, somewhere where there aren't any other plants or aren't any plants nearby. If you check in another few weeks and it still doesn't have anything showing, put it in with the rest of your plants, fine. If you have plants that you didn't even notice and they now do have mealybugs, ugh, spraying any kind of pesticides and things on that, like that on them don't don't seem to work. Rubbing alcohol, stuff like that, neem oil, I've tried loads of things, it doesn't work. The most successful way I've found getting rid of and keeping control on mealybugs is to take a toothpick uh, and some kitchen roll or some toilet paper and quite literally inspecting one by one all of your plants, every leaf, all the way up and down the stem and around the roots because they go there as well um, and literally like picking them all off basically, squashing the mealybugs and really carefully scooping away any of the horrible white cotton wool like fibres. Yeah, and just doing that literally every week, going back around everything, checking everywhere again, killing any adult mealybugs, taking away any of the cotton wool kind of nest stuff. It's only by doing that that I've found you can actually get rid of them and to be honest it's the best way to do it because you're not 
covering your plants in pesticides as well. So good luck if you have those and just be super vigilant because yeah, they are bad news. Victoria's asked how to separate succulents. Quite a lot of people ask that as well. Depends what succulent we're talking about really. But as a general rule of thumb, suckers are quite happy to be chopped up like beheaded slash have stems cut off and they will reroot from those literally chop bits off from the stem things so if you're taking leaf cuttings very gently twist a leaf off making sure you get the entire leaf right to the stem and don't snap a bit off still attached to the stem and then just pop those stem cuttings or leaf cuttings on some moist soil for a couple of weeks on a sunny windowsill and you will soon notice that they do start to throw out little roots and you can repot those. It's really, really easy. I might do a whole video on propagating succulents so I can actually show you um, how to do it. Kat has got a question about her Monstera, um, which is a cheese plant, as I mentioned before. So Kat's um, Monstera leaf has like black patches on it. I don't know how well you can see there, but basically, here are these kind of black patches with yellow kind of bits around the outside of them. Now, what it looks like to me from that is that it's got too close to a heat source. So either the sun has been shining directly on it slash reflecting from like a mirror or something like that onto the leaves and that's caused them to burn a little bit or it's been near a radiator, something like that. Sometimes those signs of stress can show up later on plants. So if it's a recent addition, you know, you bought it a couple of months ago, then it can be a sign of stress that's showing from the exposure to heat, etc., that it got before you even got it. And um, quite often plants do arrive with some damage like that. Um, I've had quite a few monsteras and my begonias arrive with damage like that black patches like that as well can be a sign of overwatering too but where it's not on the ends and it's specifically in the middle of the leaf there it looks to me like it's some kind of heat related damage. Rachel and quite a few other people have asked me how do I know when something needs repotting. Quite a lot of people ask me about cheese plants when they need repotting because they look like they're spilling over a pot everywhere. Um, cheese plants are quite happy to be in little pots for a really long time, as long as they're getting the water and the food that they need. They throw out aerial roots all over the place. Um, if your cheese plant is throwing out loads and loads and loads of aerial roots, it might be time to repot it, but don't snip those roots off. If you do repot it, it's best if you can to like tuck them into the soil. They look kind of cool as well, they're kind of structural, I like them. Generally, you know when a plant needs repotting, if foliage wise it looks like it's way bigger than the pot that it's in if the soil is dry sometimes you can actually take twist the pot off of the plant and have a little look at the roots if you've got a really tight system of roots spiraling around or roots coming out the bottom of the pot then that could be a sign that it's getting root bound and it does really need a bigger pot but generally with plants don't go from a pot say this big where it's root bound to a huge pot like this that you then put the plant in the middle in it's just like this tiny little oasis in the middle of a huge pot of soil you have to pop plants up as you repot them gradually into bigger and bigger pots because if you put it in a pot that is way too big generally when you're watering it and giving it nutrients and things like that it won't be benefiting from those. The soil might be getting very damp around it, but it won't be going specifically to the root system of the plant because it's not big enough to fill all of that space and take in the water and the, the food and stuff that you're giving it. Beth said, have I ever planted a terrarium and any tips? So yes, um, I have planted up terrariums. Um, I've got a little video coming up actually where I'm gonna show how to pop one up, but generally succulents and things like that don't actually like terrariums because the idea of a terrarium or a glass vessel with your plants in is that it creates kind of like a microclimate of humidity succulents don't like humidity they like dryness so people put succulents in terrariums all the time and then they rot slash die slash do not do very well at all and get very leggy plants that do do really well in terrariums are phytonia they're really, really pretty. They have these incredible, like neon, almost veined um, leaves and they love moisture, they love wet soil, they love humidity. Those are great. Ferns are really good in terrariums. Mini palms are really good in terrariums and also carnivorous plants like Venus flytraps and um, bell plants and things like that are really good in terrariums because they like humidity and they like a lot of moisture and they like bog-like conditions. What I would say about planting them up tip-wise is to make sure you have multiple layers at the base so not just soil in the bottom of a pot. You want to have drainage, 
so broken up pots or stones or clay pellets, things like that. You want to have soil, you want to have something that filters the water that's going through. So it looks like Katie's plant is getting too much light and not enough humidity and that's what's making it crispy. So I would say gently kind of peel off the brown crispy bits because they're not adding anything to the plant, they're taking away vital energy from the healthy parts. And then I would say mist it with a mister, keep it humid and maybe it looks like it could do with a little more water. It also looks like it might need to be in a slightly bigger pot. But yeah, I, I don't know how, because the curtain's closed in that picture, I don't know how close to direct sunlight it's getting, but to me it looks like it's getting damaged from, uh, yeah, again, too much heat and not enough humidity. Good luck Katie, it's a super beautiful variegated cheese plant. They are very in demand. Easy house plants that aren't poisonous to cats. Palms. Areca, I think it's areca or areca palm basically. It looks really pretty, it grows really big, it's very green and leafy and it's not poisonous to your cats and it's really easy to look after. Also spider plants, super easy to look after and they look really cool. Hannah has also asked what is indirect sunlight? And the best way to explain it is direct sunlight is when your plant is right on a windowsill or outside and the sun is literally shining straight unfiltered onto the leaves. Indirect sunlight is where your plant is receiving light from a room that has light in it but the sunlight isn't shining directly on that plant. So any of this plant here for example, my window is over there probably two and a half meters away. This guy is getting indirect sunlight because whilst it's still getting sun through that window the sun isn't shining directly through it onto its leaves therefore it's not direct. Hopefully that makes sense? I hope so. Another question about pests. This one isn't specifically mealybugs. I've talked about mealybugs, but I would say with any pests, the best thing to do is to get them off by hand using either ear, like, you know, like what, what are they called? Q-tips or toothpicks or a soft baby toothbrush. Um, basically brush them off get rid of them as best you can. If you have little flies, like fungus gnats, annoying little flies that kind of like hover around the plant and go in the soil, they don't really tend to do a lot of damage to the plants, but they're really annoying and they're kind of gross. So if you get those, what you want to do is take out any of the moist, sitting, stagnant soil, I guess, that you have there, get rid of that, put in the compost bin or something like that, um, and put dry, dry soil on the top of it, replace that with fresh soil, and then you can get these cool little bright yellow sticky pads, um, either that hang from the plant's leaves or stem, or ones that you stab into the soil, and they stick above the soil, and they catch them all, and basically doing having one of those in for a while tends to get rid of the problem. Alternatively, you can use a little bit of vinegar mixed with a little bit of washing up liquid and warm water, mix it all together and spritz it on the leaves and the soil of your plant and that tends to be a really good way of getting rid of things like fungus gnats nice and easily and without using kind of horrible harmful pesticides. Soils for succulents, best soil to grit ratio and care, things like that. I'm really sad and I like to make up my own little soil mix for various plants. You don't have to, you can buy purpose mixed um, cacti and succulent compost from basically all garden centres and most DIY shops. Use that if you want, it's no big deal, some of mine are still in that. Otherwise I like to use, like I said, a mixture of John In is number two. I buy horticultural grit, I literally buy all of eBay, horticultural grit, perlite and coconut core and I basically just mix them together. I don't have a specific ratio, but the grittier slash sandier, the better, really. Zabby asked, she said one of her cacti has grown loads of arms, and does that mean it needs more light? It's really hard without seeing a picture of it, Zabby, to know whether it needs more light and what you kind of definitely mean, but if it's just growing out loads of, you know, healthy looking extra arms, then that's a good thing. Cacti do that a lot. You can kind of gently pluck one of those off and um, root it and propagate it and get some more cactus babies from it. But if it's getting really spindly long arms and that are really thin and different to the body of the plant, probably does need more light or more direct sunlight, yes. So move him a lot closer to a window and hopefully he'll be happier. And like I said, any that are like too leggy and things like that, just snap them off and he'll throw out, you know, new arms that are more compact and healthier and, you know, propagate the leggy ones, see where you go. 
And she also asks about tips of leaves going brown and crispy, like um, palms and spider plants and things like that. The plant will be absolutely fine if it has little kind of crispy tips, but it does mean that it isn't massively happy. You can trim those off because like I mentioned with the Monstera earlier, Katie's variegated one, Having crispy tips isn't great for your plants. Um, it means that they still are giving energy to parts of the plant that don't need it and it's sucking energy away from the healthy bits of the plant. So trim them off if you can without damaging it or if the leaves are quite bad, literally just pull those leaves off. But generally, crispy ends of leaves means underwatering and that it's got either a draft or it's too cold or the humidity um, isn't high enough. Usually on, with spider plants and palms, cold, draft, underwatering, I guess. That would be what I would think. Watch for new growth. Um, if the new growth is coming with quickly turning to brown tips as well, then you know your plant's still not happy. If you move it somewhere else and you kind of tweak the conditions and your new growth looks healthy and has no brown tips, then I would say keep it in this new place slash keep doing those new things you're doing. <laughs> also asked how to care for pilia um, because theirs doesn't seem to grow very much and how to take cuttings from a monstera. So again, I'm gonna show you in another video how to take cuttings slash propagate monstera plants. And in terms of caring for pilia, I did that video on pilia propagation, which I shared quite a lot of tips with, that's also on my channel. But as a rule of thumb, pilias like indirect but bright sunlight, and they do like lots of water. If their stems that are poking off with the leaves on the end droop or look a little bit weepy, then give them some more water because they want to be nice and nice and you know I want to say erect but I feel like that isn't an appropriate word to use for it but that is kind of what it is right they need to be standing to attention and yeah that kind of shows they're happy so if your pilia isn't sprouting out any new babies then it might be that it's dormant because it's not that happy so more light um, and more water and feed it because again you have to feed your plants if you haven't already been feeding it and you should find that it does shoot out some new babies that you can pluck off and share with your pals. How long does it take to propagate a baby succulent from a leaf? Succulents grow quite slowly so whilst they throw out roots really quite quickly from a propagated stem or leaf cutting it can, well it does, take months and months and months for them to become normal sized mature plants as it were. If you chop the top of a plant, like you behead it, like an Echeveria, um, and root that, then you should find that that grows quicker than if you're taking a, a succulent um, leaf cutting and, and growing a new plant from there. Because what happens is, when you take a leaf cutting and you lay it on the soil and it throws new roots out, it's essentially using that leaf for the energy to create a new plant. So you don't start having leaves pop out that then add to that leaf and create a plant. Basically a baby plant with tiny baby leaves and a tiny baby stem grows off that mother leaf that you've plucked off. And as that little baby leaf grows and it takes the nutrients from the mother leaf, the mother leaf shrivels up and eventually dies and you just pluck that off and then your little baby plant is ready to go. But yeah, it, it takes a long time for succulents to grow. So if you're wanting to create a succulent army from leaf cuttings, you're probably looking at a year or a couple of years of tending to your leaf cuttings before they are looking anything like proper, you know, hulking baby succulents. <laughs> but it is worth it because you can make infinite babies from all of your lovely succulents. Loads of capillia questions. Um, <laughs> hopefully I've answered those. And then one more. Someone is about to move into their first apartment and they love some plants. Which ones would I recommend for newbies? Total plant ignorant people. Um, that's a good question. So I mentioned some easy to care for plants in a little more detail in my house plant tour video that um, is on my channel. So you can have a little look at that. But generally really good, super easy, hard to kill, plants for beginners. I would say rubber plants, not the variegated ones. Variegated plants tend to be a little more difficult to look after than they are than their standard varieties. So a rubber plant is easy to look after. You can get them in most garden centres. They look really cool, they grow really big. Also umbrella plants, they look really cool. They like lots of water, but they're pretty forgiving and easy to look after. Spider plants are super 70s and retro and they went out of fashion for a really long time, but I think they're super cool. Cheese plants. <laughs> 
I don't know why I didn't say cheese plants to start with. Cheese plants look incredible. You know, if you are a dedicated new plant mama or father, then cheese plants are a really good place to start because they grow like hellfire, they look flipping awesome, and they add so much to a home. Um, and yeah, they're, they're really forgiving as well. Hopefully, that helped you guys. Hopefully I answered all of your questions. If you have more questions, as always, pop them in the comments below and I will do my very best to answer them. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you want to see more and keep up to date. Happy plant hoarding. I'm not even sorry for enabling all of your future plant purchases. Have an ace week and I will see you soon. Bye.